guides whoever he wills to his straight path and it's not for us really to guide anybody but it is for us to deliver a message and I try to remind myself about that every day because so many times people will ask me the question, how can we get this person to Islam? How can I get that person to be a Muslim? How can we give shahada to somebody that is an atheist or somebody that's a, you know, Christian or Jew or, you know. But the fact is that Islam is not really a religion that belongs to human beings. It's a way of life prescribed by the one who created all of us in the first place. So how in the world could we really come up with something that is any different than what Allah has ordered? We can't. Otherwise we'd be making a new religion anyway. Islam, as you well know, is really based on the verb aslama, meaning that it's a relationship between us and our Creator. So how would it be that you or I would get between somebody else and Almighty Allah anyway? So we're just delivering a message and then it's Allah who guides whoever He wills. He says, he says uh, in the Quran, a rhetorical question, مَنْ ذَلَّذِي يَشْفَعُ إِنْدُهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِي who is there that could come between Allah and His creation except that He wills? He has to give them the permission to do it. And, of course, that would not mean that it's a true intercession anyway. Intercession being one who would be like um, someone who would have power beside Allah to be able to go up and say, Hey, let this guy off the hook. He's a friend of mine. Oh, okay, I have to do that. No, it doesn't work like that. Even when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the day of judgment is going to be put in a high position, such a, a position to actually go in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How is he going to go in front of Allah? Like this? Hey! No, no, no. <laughs> He's going to go and put his head on the ground. Yes? In sajda. And then he will supplicate, that's the English word, he's going to make dua according to however Allah inspires him. This is what he said. This is what he said himself, meaning that he doesn't even know what he's going to be saying, but Allah will inspire him with the words. So, you can see right away, with his head on the ground, and Allah basically putting words in his mouth, to do what? To take his ummah, those who were followers of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, out of the fire of hell. Well, there's some good news here. In fact, there's a whole lot of good news when you compare Islam to anything else. I've spent most of my life as a Christian, so obviously I do know a little bit about it. And Christianity is teaching us that the people that are the believers according to at least certain groups of Christians, they're not going to die. They're going to be like pulled up and saved. Others will tell you that there's an eternal life that they get that everybody else doesn't get. Then some of them will talk about being in paradise. Everybody else goes to hell. But the good news in Islam is that everybody gets this eternal life. It's not limited. Everybody gets eternal life. Good or bad. Everybody, everybody gets eternal life. The problem is where? That's the problem. 
There's some more good news, bad news that comes up. Which one do you want first? How many say, give me the bad news first? Okay, oh, yeah, give me the bad news first. Bad news is some people, Muslims, are going to go to hell. It's bad news. You ready for the good news? They won't have to stay there. That's the good news. Because anybody who even had a speck, you know, actually he used the term a grain, like a small grain, smaller than a grain of rice, something tiny, this much belief that there really is only one God, Allah. They have this belief, La ilaha illallah, that none is deserving any worship, none is deserving any devotion, and none is deserving any of this kind of attention other than the one true God. If they have this, then they will get out of the hellfire eventually. Still kind of like bad news, good news. Eventually. How bad is hellfire? You ever thought about that? Some people might say, well, you know, I did some bad things, but hey, I'll just go to hell for a little while. As though what? That's not a bad deal? Or they might say that, well, there are different levels in the hell. Some worse than others. Maybe I'll just go to the goodest place. Like that goodest place. Huh? Is there a goodest place in the hellfire? Mm -mm -mm -mm. There's levels though. There's one level that's so bad, even the rocks that are burning there are afraid of it. And it's really horrible. The worst is that even the fire itself is afraid. That's horrible. But that's reserved for the worst of the worst of the worst. Prophet Muhammad Wasallam had an uncle, Abu Talib. You know about his uncle? Yeah. He's a good guy. By our standards, by human being standards, we say he's a good guy. He was nice, he was kind. He did good deeds. He supported the Muslims. He helped them when nobody else would help them. In fact, the only thing about the guy was he just wouldn't say the shahada. That's the only really bad thing about it. He just refused to say there's only one God worthy of my worship. He said, you know what? I'm coming from a culture, background of people that worship these gods. And how could that be now? He's on his deathbed. How would it look, you know, to everybody, if I abandon the religion of my forefathers for this. It wouldn't look right. People might, you know, think, oh, it's like a coward or something. So, now nah, I'll just stay with what I got. And he died. He died without the kalam of Allah. Allah, Allah. And so, Rasul Sallallahu was making dua for him, praying for him. And he said, I'll keep doing that unless Allah shows me something. Other than that. And of course, that's when the verse in the Quran comes and it makes it clear that you can't do that. If somebody died without the kalama, you don't pray for them. Because Allah knows and we don't. Allah, He knows and we don't know. So then the Prophet ﷺ told us. His uncle, Abu Talib, would be in the best part of the hellfire. The best part. What's the best part of hellfire? Standing on rocks that are so hot, your brains are boiling. Ugh. That's the best part. No wonder they call it hell. And what about the one who said, well, we'll only be there a short time. I'm talking about, you know, ten, you know, 50 years, 100 years. Who cares? Maybe. Except that the Prophet Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him,
told us about two people that will come on the day of judgment. One of them, he had everything in this life. Anything he asked for, he got it. The other one, he didn't get the things that he asked for. Now, the one who had everything, when the angel of death came to him to take his soul, he wants one more thing, a feast set in front of him, and he got that. Then the angel took his soul. The other one, he didn't even get to drink a glass of water. It's all he wanted with water, and he didn't get that, and the angel took his soul. Now, the one who had everything in this life, they put him into, in the next life, they put him into the hellfire like you might put a pin into something and pull it out. How quick could you do that? You know, maybe you got a pillow or something, you just take a pin. That's what, a nanosecond? And the one who had nothing in this life, didn't get the things he wanted, put him into paradise. Same way you put a pin and pull it out. Now the one that had everything, after coming out of the fire, that just the second, they ask him, in your whole life, where you had everything, he said, did you ever see anything good? He said, I've never ever seen anything good. The other one that had all the difficulties in this life, put him into the paradise just for a second and pull him out and ask him, now in your whole life, do you ever see anything bad? He said, in my whole life, I never saw anything bad. So the experience of either one totally removes whatever you were concerned about here. What were you worried about here? Because I guarantee you, as soon as you get to the next life, you're not going to remember it either way. If you wind up in a bad place, you won't remember anything good about this place. So all the stuff that you're chasing after, all the things you're trying to build up here, all of the wealth, the power, the society, the status of, look at me. Okay, that's all going to be gone. You got zip. Horrible. The other one, the one who is sacrificing in this life, the one who is suffering in this life, you're still going to forget about all that as soon as you get to paradise because it's going to be everything that you wanted and more. You will not be able to fathom in this life either one of those two places. There's just no way. Now, the prophet, peace be upon him, taught us something about this too. He said there's Use a word like hijab, a covering. There's a covering over the hellfire. A covering over the hellfire, which is your vain desires. Nafs. Your desires. But you see the hellfire as being good because of your desires. But there's a covering over the paradise. Makes it unattractive to you. Because of what? It's the things you didn't like in this world. So, just a lot of the things that we look at every day, if you flip them and look at it from the other side, that's really the reality of the next life. So, receiving things in this life is likely, if you want to keep everything in balance, is likely to put you in a very bad way. Giving things in this life will do what? Put you in a better condition. Now, this is not, this is not unlike, in other words, it's just like the teaching of Christianity. Simple statement in Christianity, you hear it all the time, especially at Christmas time when somebody wants you to give a gift. It says, it's better to give than to receive. <laughs> exactly. This is exactly how it goes. If you understand that, and then you can understand a little bit about what Islam is teaching us when it says the Prophet ﷺ, peace be upon him, taught us a dunya sijnu mu'min wa jannatul kafir. Does anybody speak Lagut Arabiya? Anybody speak Arabic? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, whoa. More ladies than men are speaking Arabic language here. All right. Well, you know what I said. For those of you who don't know Arabic, I'll go slow. 
Dunya means the material world that we live in. A dunya, the material world that we live in. Sijnal movement. Sijin in Arabic means a prison or a jail. Movement is a believer. So this material life is a prison for a believer. Wajannat, and that means the paradise for the kafir, disbeliever. Is that true? Uh, the Prophet وسلم, he said it. Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, told us this. Do we believe that? Well, let's look at it for a minute. If you go to prison, what's the first thing that you notice? Besides the bars. What's the first thing? You notice you can't be with the people you want to be with. Right? You can't be with the one you love the most. Right? No. So, is that the same for us? As Muslims, we love Allah more than anything. But we can't be with Allah because we're here. And Allah is not here. We love Prophet Muhammad more than anything. But he's not here. He's in the next life waiting. Huh? So, that's what we want. We're not with the ones we love. We're not with the righteous people. We're not with the ones who died, sacrificed before. All of the prophets, all of these great wonderful people, they're not with us. So, this whole life is a prison. That's one. How about food? In a prison, what happens when you want food? Do you like get this? They give you a little sheet at night. You can fill it out. Which you, I'll have T-bone, mashed potatoes and gravy, iced tea, fresh peas, corn on the cob, popcorn. Yeah, I like some popcorn. And um, I think I'll have Cherry's Jubilee for dessert. Yeah, turn it in. And what will you get? Ha! 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 Mush, baby. <laughs> You're lucky to get oatmeal. That's it. And it won't be hot anyway. Am I right? Anybody ever been in a prison? I work in prison, so I know. But if you ever been around one, been in it, talk to anybody who's been in, uh, you don't get to eat what you want. Is this true for the Muslims in this world? Yes, yeah, a lot of things we can't eat. Legally, in Islam, you're not supposed to eat pork, right? Huh? And somebody's telling me we're not supposed to be eating lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. <laughs> I, I didn't really want to eat a lion anyway. Did you? Did you imagine that? <laughs> mm. You get a hamburger out of a lion. That doesn't sound like that. I guess it'd be no different than giraffe burger. That doesn't sound very good either. Uh, but coming back to the subject, we can't drink what we want either. There's a lot of drinking things that people are doing all the time. Uh, 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 uh. We can do that. True. Yeah. What about clothes? In prison? Can you pick out the clothes you'd like? Taylor comes by Measures you up for a new heart chapter mark suit. Oh, don't forget the vest. Or they just throw you two things, an upper and a lower. Go for it. You say the, the bottom's too tight and the top's too loose. Okay, put the bottom on that. The bottom, put the top on. Switch it out. Who cares? And color. Oh, <laughs> that prisons never have a cool color. <laughs> never. So. In our life, we also have a dress code, yeah? Muslims have a dress code. And it doesn't always go along with whatever is the coolest fashion that we're watching the guys on TV, right? No. So, again, there's a good comparison. But by now, we've discovered that, hey, that prison here is not as bad as being a Muslim. It's not so bad after all, is it? But now let's look at it from the other point of view, the paradise for the disbeliever. Now the Prophet Sassam used the word kafir. Kafir comes from kafara. Kafara is a, is a verb meaning to cover up something. This literally is covering. Like Allah makes kufr. Do you know, how many of you know that? Allah does kafir. Huh? He does. 
all the time. We hope he does. And when he covers up our sins, kapara, he covers up your sins. When you go to him and repent, and then he keeps it covered up for you. So that's kafara, covering it up. But the idea in Islam of kufr, actually it means disbelief, because the one who is doing this has been exposed in some way or another to truth, and they're covering it up. The truth never goes away, but they endeavor to cover it up. And of course they'll never be successful at it. But Now what about this life being a paradise for one who is covering the truth? Many times we see people who are bad people. We know they're bad. They do really bad things. But somehow or another, they wind up with a lot of good stuff in this life. They do. It's kind of amazing. Certain individuals and their groups who will go out and literally destroy other people and take away from them their property, crush their families, and then all of a sudden they got big houses, nice cars. Or, yeah? And you're thinking, wow, why are they getting all of this? If you use the human standard to compare, you'd have to make the conclusion that being bad is better than being good because the good guys, according to this, always finish last. Very seldom do you see somebody who is humble and kind and sweet, generous, charity giving, is going to be the leader, a, a leader of any country. Is that true? And that's not that I would pick on any particular leader of any country, especially because I need to go to all these countries, so I'm going to do that. But at the same time, we have to ask ourselves, how is it in this world that these aggressive individuals who will compromise immediately to get what they want, how is it they get all of this stuff and then the ones who are sacrificing, the ones who are really kind people, many times they wind up with nothing. And the good health is even going to these bad guys, and disease is coming to the good guys. An atheist will look at that and say, see, that proves there's no God. He does. That's, how he, that's his evidence right there. And this, of course, is the ultimate cover-up, isn't it? So how does that work? And we think about it. When somebody is getting everything they want in this life, they better think twice because it could mean you've got nothing waiting for you in the next life. And that's pretty scary. Maybe you said, I don't have to worry about it, I'm a Muslim. I got news for you, that's the same thing Christian says. I don't have to worry about it, I'm a Christian. That's the same thing Jew says. That's the same thing Hindu says. In fact, that's what everybody says as long as what they're getting what they want. Hmm? It's not really until we start losing and we start thinking and, hey, wait a minute. Maybe let me think about my religion now. Hmm? Now's a good time to go to God. Why? Well, I'm having a problem. Before everything was cool, so... <laughs> but now it's time to think. And what about the one, though? Now watch this. There's, there's one more in this category I want to think about. The one who is, quote-unquote, the kafir, the one who covers the truth, one who doesn't believe in God. Yeah? Doesn't believe. Or believes in all kinds of gods, makes up gods as he goes, whatever. Good luck gods, you know. The kind you carry in your pocket, you need something, you whip it out. Hey, hey, got my lucky god. You heard about that, right? Guys wear these bracelets and things like that's going to cure them or give them something and they got lucky bracelet, lucky ring, lucky uh, horseshoe. Lucky horseshoe, you heard about that? Where they, some, by the way, some societies over the centuries believed that if you put a horseshoe over the door, it was good luck. I always wondered what would happen if you slammed the door and it fell down. He wouldn't think it was very good luck, would he? And what about the rabbit's foot? Have you ever heard about the good luck rabbit's foot? People used to carry those. When I was a kid, they had keychains that had this piece of a real rabbit's foot hanging on it. And then you'd be like, you'd go start the car and you look at that dangling foot. And I would think, how was that lucky for the rabbit? 
You know, here goes the Easter Bunny. He's on crutches going, hey, it wasn't lucky for me. <laughs> but what about the one who doesn't believe? The bad guy, okay? He's really bad. He's a thief. He's a rotten liar. He's an alcoholic. He's a bum. He does everything bad. I don't want to give you any more ideas than that. <laughs> but he also is poor. He's poor. He has nothing in this life. And he also gets diseases. He also has cancer or tuberculosis. Something like that, you know? And he's laying there in the hospital bed. <coughs> and, you know, and he's complaining. And you tell him the hadith, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a dunya sajnu mu'min wa jannatul kafir. You tell him, Prophet Muhammad said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that this material world is the only paradise for you guys, but it's the prison for the Muslims, the believers. And he's going to say, oh yeah? Oh yeah? Hey, what about me? Look at the condition I'm in. See how bad off I am? And I don't believe what you believe, so that disproves your theory. Mm -mm. You forgot. I just told you when we started the program, didn't I? That one second in the hellfire will wipe out any good you ever saw in this life. So by contrast and comparison, the guy in the hellfire for one second will look back on the worst condition in this life and go, hey man, that was heaven. That was paradise. That was Jannah. Huh? Amazing, isn't it? For us living in this life, it's sometimes difficult to keep it in perspective to remember that this really isn't our ultimate resting place. We're not going to stay here. You're not going to keep continuing here. It seems like it. For you woke up yesterday, you woke up today. Good chance you'll wake up tomorrow, but Allah alam. We just keep waking up so we keep going on. We do whatever we do. Hmm, I got away with it another day. Let's do it again. Another day opens up for you. Hey, here we go again. The first year of your life was 365 days. If you use the sun calendar, 354. If you use the moon calendar, it doesn't really matter. You don't remember it. I don't remember it. First year, nobody remembers. Second year, you stagger around, fall over the coffee table, stuff like that. Everybody says how cute you are. <laughs> Third year, you learn how to talk. Fourth year, they wish they had never taught you. You know how it goes. <laughs> Fifth year, you go into school, and then the world really starts opening up to you. And you're like, wow, look at all this stuff going on. Oh, man, school, that's an amazing thing. I hate it. And then, <laughs> sometimes. And sixth grade, uh, all, all the way from the first to the sixth grade, we used to call it the elementary school, the beginning or primary school. And you meet friends, you start learning about other things. But all along the way, you never ever for one second think about one day I may wake up dead. In other words, not wake up at all. It doesn't enter your mind. You go through the middle school, you go into the high school, and somewhere along there, now somebody dies. Your aunt dies. Your grandmother dies. Some teacher you know died. Somebody died. Somebody you knew their name or you knew something about them. They died. Now you're like, Huh. So we're not going to see them anymore. Nope. They're gone. Hmm. Well, there's still lots of other people around. Or maybe somebody really close to you dies. And it makes you think. But still, you move on. And this continues on through your life. Now, as you get older, you start thinking a little bit more about it because more and more of the people you know die. Until you get around 80 or 90 and then almost everybody you used to know is dead. <laughs> then maybe you'll start thinking, hey, that could be me next. But in reality, it could be any one of us at any time. Isn't that right? Is there any guarantee you're going to go to bed tonight and wake up tomorrow morning? Not really. Is there any guarantee that you will eventually die? Think about that one. We don't really think of that one, do we? 
That's the only most obvious fact of life is death and we never think about it. Almost never. But it's the most obvious fact. As soon as you're born, you're going closer and closer to the day you die. That's all the more reason why you shouldn't celebrate a birthday. It just got closer to dying. <laughs> think about it. What are you celebrating? Happy birthday to you! You're another year closer to being dead. You Scary, isn't it? Any minute. Any one of us. And I've seen it happen. I remember one time talking about the subject, about death and dying. And the next morning in the newspaper, as I was flying out, it was mentioned a story, it was in Trinidad, that a lady had come to the speech that night. She had asked her son to go with her. It was in the paper. He said, nah, I want to stay with my friends. She got a phone call at the venue, at the place, telling her to get home, something's happened to your son. He's like 20 years old, okay? She came home, he was laying on the kitchen floor dead. Huh. Now, aren't you glad you came to my speech tonight? <laughs> but it makes you think the one thing that we know is going to happen regardless, you don't have to be a Muslim to figure it out you don't have to be a Christian an atheist anybody has got to come to grips the conclusion you're going to die I'm going to die now, in the Bible, I found a passage. It was a real popular one. We used to use it all the time. But we didn't really think about it when we said it. We really didn't. Never tried to analyze it. Because a lot of stuff, when you're a Christian, you just say what everybody else says and go along with it. and It's fun, sort of. But it says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, I'll be blessed up for a that whosoever believeth in Him will not die, but they're going to live forever. Everlasting life. That's what it says. In the church that I went to at that time, the preacher used to tell us, because you would ask him, but... You mean really don't die? He said, yeah. If you really, really believe when the rapture comes, you're going to be picked up and carried up into heaven and you won't have to go through the experience of dying. That sounds good. That sounds really good. I mean, and there's people who believe it. Not a lot, but there are some. But if you read the same book, the same exact book, it tells them that Jesus died. So evidently he didn't believe it. <laughs> and I never caught that one. I also didn't catch the fact that for the last 2,000 years everybody that preached it died. So they must not have believed it either. Actually, it, I'm sure it didn't mean literally what it said. Obviously not. Jesus wouldn't have said something like that anyway. But what did Allah say clearly in the Quran? Kulu nafsan Every soul will taste death. So let's talk about that. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he told us about what's going to happen in the very end days of this earth. He talked about the earthquakes. He talked about the signs that would come. He even talked about what's going to happen in Mecca, about the destruction of the Kaaba. He told us of some of the big upheavals in the earth itself. Mountains coming down like carded wool. That's in the Quran. Many of the things that are going to take place in the very last days are very scary. But then eventually there won't be anybody left. And after the last human being dies, when there's nobody left at all, there's still angels. 
And that's when the law is going to tell the angel of death to go to the angels and to begin to take their, their souls from them. The angel of death will begin removing the souls of the angels until the only one left is the archangel, the Holy Spirit. Ruh Kudus. That's the title of Jibril. The angel Gabriel is the Holy Spirit. That's what it says in the Quran. We know that. Which, by the way, was another big revelation for yours truly because I always wondered about this Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit thing. And when I found it in Islam, oh, it made a lot of sense. Not part of a trinity, it's just the title of the angel Gabriel. But even then, Allah will send the angel of death, the malakal moat, to him and say, take his soul. Now, nobody can resist the angel of death. When he comes, that's it. In fact, the only one ever in history to stand up to the angel of death, really, was who? Musa, alayhi salam. Yeah? He smacked him. You remember Musa, alayhi salam? Moses is the one who hit the Egyptian and killed him dead with one pop. Remember that? He didn't mean to kill him. I just want to put him down a little bit. <laughs> but when we went, after the angel of death came to him, it's like, boom! He knocked his eye out. Remember? And, and the angel of death's going back with his eye hanging out to Allah and saying, Moses knocked my eye out. <laughs> but Allah told him, you know, this is time for you to die, so he has to go along with it. Now, when it comes to Gabriel, Jibril, salam, the angel of death is taking this great and amazing soul, the Holy Spirit himself, taking his soul. Then there's nobody left except the angel of death. And Allah says, take your own soul. And he did. And as he was removing his own soul, his last words, if I would have known it was like this, I could have never taken the first one. You want to think about death? The angel of death says this. If I would have known it felt like this, I couldn't have taken the first one. Now, nobody's left at all. Now, the prophet is telling us what's been given to him in Revelation. He's telling us what's going to happen. Not that he has any control over it. Not that he's adding to or taking away from it. He's just telling us this is what's going to happen. And then, after a period of time, as long as Allah wills, it could be... For us, millions of years or two seconds, but it's up to Allah. But as long as Allah wills, and then he's going to say, Now, where are those kings that they wanted to set up as partners with me in worship? Where are they? And there will be, of course, no answer. And then Allah will cause everything to come back. He'll bring it all back again. All of us. And that's what I said. This is good news. Everybody's going to be brought back. Everybody will be brought back. Every single soul shall be brought back in a body. And a lot of people are complaining about this. It's mentioned in Quran and even today. How will I be brought back in a body? How is that? How? I mean, after our bones turn to dust, you say we're going to come back? <laughs> oh boy, where do you get that stuff? But who created you in the first place? When we started out, you and I, all of us, when we started out, we were what we call today in embryology an egg, a zygote, a little teeny egg. That's it. <laughs> Fertilized by a sperm attaching inside the wall of the raham or womb and starting out clinging, hanging, and forming an alaqa. And from that we came forth. Yes or no? 
So how did that turn into bones? There's no bones in it. There's nothing in it. You, if you want to, go ahead and put it under a microscope and take a look. That's not a little bitty human being. That's what people used to think. That's what people used to think, that there were little teeny and tiny human beings just kind of like got bigger inside of the mother and came out. This is what they thought. Now, embryology is a science. 1,400 years ago, excuse me, 400 years ago in the West, nobody had a clue. 1,400 years ago, Allah clearly spelled it out from the time we are conceived inside of our mothers, the trimesters, the development, the in shape, out of shape, all of the shapes, even talking about our hearing develops before our eyes. All of this is in the Quran as a sign, as a proof to the human being who created you, who knows most about you, who's the one that blew life into you, and who's the one that wrote for you your risk, your daily bread? Who's the one that provides even the oxygen you breathe and you don't have the courtesy to say thank you? That's the point, isn't it? That's the point. And Allah will bring us all back. Every one of us will be brought back. And we will have bodies. And nobody will have any clothes on because that, <laughs> that wasn't part of the deal. Now, Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, peace be upon him, she asked, oh, you know, because Muslim women, how they dress, they're all very, very conservative, super conservative, very modest, and she's concerned. He said, don't worry about it, because nobody's going to be looking at anybody else on that day. They're all going to be walking around saying, nafsi, 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 nafsi. Arabic, it means myself, myself, what kind of trouble am I in? What is this to be today? That's all the concern we're going to have. Because we'll all realize clearly then what we should have been realizing right here. What we didn't plan for. Huh? We didn't get ready for that. Hmm? Oh yeah, we did the... Well, I don't know what you have here in Australia, but back home, we got the Keogh plan and 405 and all this retirement benefits that we're working for, putting some pension aside, planning, all the time planning, you know? Build it up. Okay, I'm ready to go. Not one thing did we plan for the next life. Nothing. Nothing. And so there you stand on the day of judgment. And the sun will be brought close. Just so much over the heads of the people that they will be standing in their own sweat to the neck. <coughs> And no relief from the sun, no relief from this heat, no shade, no dhil, illa, the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the shades of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is only going to be for certain people, the ones that planned ahead, <laughs> the ones that really thought about it, and they didn't try to get stuff for this dunya, but they wanted it for that akhir. For the hereafter. Because they realized what the Prophet ﷺ said was true. Adunya. Sijnu mu'min. Wa jannatu kafir. This material life is a prison to a believer. But it's the only paradise for the disbeliever. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Hu Aladhi Jamla Muslimin All the praise to the one who made us Muslim. I'll leave you with that thought. It was great to be with all of you tonight. And I thank Allah so much that He guided me before I met the angel of death. And I pray for everybody I meet that Allah will guide them the same way. Because that's the best thing that happened to any other. جزاكم الله خير والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله أفمن شرح الله صدره للإسلام فهو على نور من ربه فويل للقاسية قلوبهم من ذكر الله